Good afternoon, friends. My name is Arian Kafey, and I'm the Vice President of the Coral Consortium of San Diego, here to welcome you to our Conductor Conversation event this January. Um, I am here with my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Nicola Dedman and Aaron Humble. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome both of them today. Uh, this is a service organization, Coral Consortium, composed of choruses and individuals who support the choral art form um, throughout San Diego County. Uh, and today we are um, we're lucky to have Nicola Bertoni, uh, excuse me, Nicola Dedman, who is outside of San Diego County. Ooh. So we have <laughs> throwback. Uh, and Aaron Humble, who is newly appointed director of choral activities at Cal State San Marcos. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming them. And I am going to hand off the mic to them. Thank you, you two. Hmm. Right. You want to go, Aaron? Sure, I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> as Aaron mentioned, my name is Aaron Humble. Uh, I am a recent transplant to San Diego. I moved here in July to uh, take the choral and vocal program at Cal State San Marcos. Uh, before that, I was at Minnesota State in Mankato for six years, and before that at Augustana College in Rock Island. Um, uh, I spent about 10 years singing with the vocal ensemble Contus, uh, before I got into teaching, but I am very happy to be in San Diego, uh, you know, for obvious weather related reasons, uh, but I'm also very happy to uh, be part of a choral community that is really looking to grow and, uh, and just is open to all, all kinds of new ideas and new ways of trying things. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. And it's really nice to meet you, Aaron. And um, to everyone else who will join us later, my name is Nicola Dedman, uh, she, her pronouns. And um, I currently am at Fullerton College in Orange County, California, Southern California. Um, before my time at Fullerton College, I was a graduate student at Westminster Choir College, where I sang in the Westminster Choir and in Cantorai. So that was a lot of my my upbringing and experience there. Um, East Coast, born and raised, uh, but now I'm California converted. I love living out West. Um, <clears throat> something interesting about my time here at Fullerton College, I, I'm the coordinator of choral studies here, so I conduct the chamber singers and the concert choir. In the past, I have conducted also our treble chorale and our tenor bass chorale. I do teach private voice lessons here as well as part of our applied uh, voice program. And I do teach some general education courses. And in the past, I've taught theory. Um, the past year, I spent um, the 2022 spring and fall semesters as our interim dean of fine arts. And so I was thrilled to step back from that position and return to my full-time focus of teaching. But I also learned a whole lot about the community college system, um, what makes the wheels turn, and the admin side of what we do and how that can contribute to our art making um, and into equity goals with our students and all of that. So I'm very excited to have that knowledge as well. Um, <clears throat> I forgot to mention, I, I do use he, him pronouns, and I, I'll just give you a little rundown on what mm -hmm. I teach as well, too. That was uh, good thinking. <laughs> uh, I conduct the choir. Uh, I teach some applied voice, uh, and I'm teaching music history. Um, I've been waiting to teach music history for a long time. You know, I, I minored in music history and musicology in graduate school. And so I expected that would come early in my teaching career because usually people aren't lining up to teach music history. But at all of the mm -hmm. places I've taught, there were always plenty of people that wanted to teach it. So I'm, I'm really excited to have the chance to teach that. Um, and I'm teaching class voice as well, which is another another class that I really love to teach because every time I've taught it, the students form this great community and they support each other so much through the process of, you know, the nerves of getting up and singing in front of each other. Uh, I've, I also used to teach quite a bit in the choral methods uh, and music education sequence in my last position. So <laughs> I'm, <clears throat> I'm really excited to be here today and I'm going to kick us off with our first question. Uh, so this is for Nicola. What is your earliest memory of thinking, I want to be a professional musician? <laughs> this is always a fun question. Um, 
the first time in my life that I knew that I was maybe more musical than average, like that it wasn't normal. Um, what I could do was when I was, I think it was eight years old and I got the lead in the school musical and it was Annie. Um, and I remember when I got the lead in that school musical and people kept making comments about, um, how quickly I could learn the music and how I could harmonize at such a young age with, with ease. That was when I started to pick up on, oh, okay, so actually this is something that I'm very good at that not everybody can do. And that was the first time I realized that I had a talent for it, but also an interest in, in it. And I don't remember when I said, oh, I want to be a professional musician. I really don't have one memory. I, the, the biggest memory that sticks out of my head is when I realized that this was not something everybody does. Um, and I think from then on, it was always about music. It was always about how can we take singing somewhere? Um, I do remember when I wanted to be a choral musician for the first time. Now I, I did not, I went to a wonderful high school for performing. Uh, it wasn't a high school for performing arts, but it had a strong performing arts program with regard to theater and musical theater. And it did not have a choral program when I was there. Now it does, thank goodness, but it didn't have one when I was there. So when I went to college, the first real serious choir that I ever sang in SATB format was my freshman year of college. And um, I walked in, I saw a flyer for chorale auditions, which is like the, the large master of work group. And I said, oh, sure, I'll audition for that. I, I found it by chance. I went in and I sang the audition and I was one of eight freshmen that got in as freshmen. And I remember sitting on the first day and reading through Henry Purcell's Hear My Prayer, O Lord, and eight parts and I'm sure that we actually didn't do that great of a job of reading it, but in my memory, it was a perfect read the first time. And the thought that you could sit with other musicians and, and sing and read and make music at that level, um, I was hooked. And from that point forward, even though I had entered as a performance major, I knew that choral music was it for me. Um, that was, that memory just really is burned into my mind, but I always wanted to be a musician. Yeah. So I... I would love to hear your answer as well. Like when did, when did you want to be a professional musician? Yeah, boy, it's the word professional that right. trips me up a little bit. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I have a great idea of when I understood that that was an option, you know? <laughs> so I, I grew up in a pretty musical family. We, uh, you know, my mom played the piano and we would sing hymns and harmony and we would sing Peter, Paul and Mary and, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, you know, <clears throat> music is easy to harmonize, you know, a lot of that in the car. Uh, and, and so music was always present. And <clears throat> I started performing more seriously in high school. And I, I have this memory of uh, singing in the, the TTBB choir for, uh, with my high school. And we were singing the Bible Ave Maria, a piece mm -hmm. that I ended up singing, you know, 400,000 times with Cantus. Um, but that was my first introduction to the piece. And we were working through it. And I went to a rural school in Ohio, but for some reason we had a pretty, pretty good choral program, mm -hmm. with like probably mm -hmm. 300, 200, 300 kids singing. And it was this interesting mix of, you know, we had, I was like, I was a music nerd and just a regular nerd, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we had also had a lot of athletes who would like come in their baseball uniform and then they'd have to go right to practice. Or we had the captain of the football team was in the base section. And I remember when we were rehearsing the end of the Beeble, and it's a great climax uh, mm -hmm. in that piece. <clears throat> I remember seeing the guy who was the captain of the football team his last name was Joy, which was appropriate because he was just like a, a great, great all around guy. And he just had tears running down his face mm. and just absolutely unafraid to show who he was and his emotions. And, and um, that was that had a big impact that you know, music has this power to transcend and to transform and also sort of the community around that. Right. So, you know, the the nerdy kids like me and the, the, the star of the football team, you know, those are not people that maybe in other places in high school had moments to intersect. But we did, you know, and I think that probably changed sort of the 
the tenor, no pun intended, of, mm -hmm. of the whole vibe in the school. And then I went on to Millican for undergrad, which is a great choral program. And the first time I heard the uh, <clears throat> the the university choir, I was I was blown away, and mm -hmm. I I knew that 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 was going to be be part of my future. And so I I, I did major in performance three times times <laughs> three different degrees but I I always was taking conducting I was always minoring in conducting and so I you know it was like I don't want to pick a side mm -hmm. I, I, and I still don't want to pick a side I want to be able to sing as a soloist um, as long as my voice lets me do that uh, but I also can't imagine not singing and conducting with with choral music because that community aspect is still something that is just at the top of the list for me. It's it's funny you say that I I finished out my performance degree in undergrad despite falling in love on the first day with choral music and I did finish it out, um, and I, I you know I had a lot of mixed opinions from different people as to whether that was a wise decision but um, I you know I have no regrets for that because I'm really grateful for the performance side right. you know I'm, I feel much more comfortable um, teaching private voice uh, which then informs the way that you conduct choirs so I I do think it is good to even if you don't necessarily have a performance degree to always keep your your toes dipped in the performance area um, I always recommend that to students so yeah um, okay good question number two and it's a it's a big one. <laughs> uh, what trends and challenges do you anticipate for the choral art in the next five years? Oh boy. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, I'm thinking something that I don't want to say out loud, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway, because mm -hmm. that's just the kind of person I am. Mm -hmm. But um, can it be worse, like, than what we've been through in the last <laughs> four years or three years, you know, <laughs> like, <clears throat> I have to think that the challenges that we will face in the future, as long as we are able to be in the same room and make music safely, uh, can't compare to to what we went through mm -hmm. over the past three years. Um, and at the same time, surely there are going to be challenges. Um, I, <clears throat> you know, having spent a long part of my life in Minnesota, the, the weather makes it very convenient to have indoor activities in Minnesota mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for a good part of the year. I yeah. think specifically in California, you know, like you're always going to be competing with the beach, right? Right. You're always going to be competing with the surfboard. Mm -hmm. uh, like that's, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, that I think has probably always been there for California and and will remain. Uh, I'm hopeful with uh, the passage of Prop 28 that that will start to build a little bit more of a pipeline that will eventually reach uh, community colleges and universities, but that's going to be a very slow process. And I also, I, I'm not naive. I don't think that it's going to be magical. Um, you know, in San Diego County, they're talking about potentially a half position per school on average, mm -hmm. you know, and that's for art, theater, dance, music, the arts, you know, everything combined. So I don't think it's going to be the cure all for music ed, but I, I, I do think that the <clears throat> music education is going to be continuing, will continue to be challenging in California. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> not enough young people are exposed to the arts mm -hmm. and the the ripple effects of covid uh are going to be with us for a long time you know why why did i go to school for music why did you go to school for music right. we both talked about school and we talked about these sort of mountaintop experiences that we had in you know eighth through twelfth grade mm -hmm. now we have three years worth of students who didn't have those experiences right and now they're hopefully going to have them, but they might be a little wobbly and not quite on their feet yet. And so I think I think that will be the biggest challenge will be just 
we want it to be back to normal, like the snap of our fingers, mm -hmm. but really it's going to be years of ripple effects of rebuilding. And in some parts of the state, building the pipeline for the first time. Yeah, I would, I would have to agree with that. Um, <clears throat> my first thought was, you know, of course we're out of the emergency phase. You know, we don't have to make Zoom choir anymore. We don't have to make those horrible um virtual choir things, you know, where you listen to the same piece over and over and over again. You know, I, I actually, I struggled to listen to some of the pieces that we did a virtual choir for. It almost ruined, it almost ruined that music for me. Um, I'm, I'm programming some of the pieces I did virtually so that I can have a better experience with them live. <laughs> it's kind of a selfish reason to program, but, um, but in any event, I, I agree. It can't get worse than that, but I, I think, um, I'm noticing an interesting phenomenon, at least in my experience last year. So of course I'm not K through 12. So it's it's less linear, the path many of my students take. Um, it can be more roundabout. Uh, they can hang out for um, several years longer than we would hope. <laughs> Even though we adore them, we, we do want people to transfer on. And sometimes that's more difficult. So we, it, it's a less linear path. And I noticed that last year I had one of the smallest choirs I had ever had but it was by far the most advanced, the most dedicated, um, the most bought in, if that makes sense. They were completely bought in to singing together, singing in person. Um, between the fall and spring semesters, I typically have about 10, 15% attrition. And last year, I had 0% attrition besides two students who, who transferred. So they transferred from the fall semester out. And I don't really count that. That's what we want them to do, right? But not a single student did not return, which has never happened in my, at the time, seven years of teaching there. I'd never seen that. This year, that's not the case. Um, it was, it's back to the, back to the about 10, 15% attrition between the semesters. Um, <clears throat> and I've noticed, and I, I've, you know, if any of my students are listening, I still adore you all. And I still love my choir and they're still fabulous. Um, but it is different from last year. And I noticed that we are getting students who did, like you said, did not have those types of mountaintop performance experiences. Um, and I think the most important part of that is that those are really formative years in your, in your musical development and in your development as a human, like your psychological development. And there was not a whole lot of structure for those students. So it's it's very difficult to then enter a very structured environment for choir in a college setting where you have to learn to create your own boundaries and your own structure. You have to make yourself show up for um for choir rehearsal and I'm finding that there's a little more of a struggle um, it's a little more of a green group, if that makes sense. They're incredibly talented, wonderful people, all the same heart. Um, but last year, I think I had the students who hung out um, and and made it through COVID, but they already were kind of like the, the their molding had finished casting. Like they were already the musicians that they were. And now I'm finding some students who... Um, you know, and it's not their fault. We, the world, the universe failed them. Right. And so I do think it will get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately. Um, I just did an honor choir, which was a wonderful experience, but something that, that was interesting to me was that the middle school, um, was a much stronger musical experience. The middle schoolers, um, seem to be a little more locked in focused, I have never seen, I've never had that experience before. And I think it's because um, they're a little more malleable or maybe their first choral experience was the normal choral experience. And so that's mm -hmm. what they had. They never really had to experience Zoom choir in the same way that their high school counterparts did. Um, and so I think it will get better. And, and again, this is not me disparaging anyone. I think this is just the result of, people not being in practice of something and then also not being exposed to something that makes them feel passionate about it. Um, Zoom choir is not something that makes anyone feel really happy and passionate. I'm sorry. And I, and I know we all worked really hard on it and we are proud of what we did at the time, but it doesn't make anybody want to stay. And, um, and I think we're starting to give students those experiences, but they may have some, they may have a wall up. They may have some trust issues with the whole process and I don't blame them. So I think our challenge is going to be rebuilding those communities and rebuilding a sense of 
of this is something that you want to stay for. This is something you want to, to be committed to. So um, I hope that made sense. I, that, I talked a little longer than I planned on that one, but it's big. I think this pandemic really shook us all. Um, and there will be some good parts of it, but but I think it's going to be a massive challenge. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I, I think, you know, we've all experienced this as some of our life remains to be online, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps like this experience, <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, you know, but faculty meetings that are on mm -hmm. Zoom, way different experience than being in the room together. Yep. And if I need to put up my younger self headshot and go get a cup of tea, I can do that. Right. Um, and I think I see my students sometimes <laughs> wishing that they had right. that option during class, right? Not so yeah. much in choir, but in lecture classes where the students are just, you know, they wish that they could just turn off the camera and walk away, uh, but they can't. So I, I, I do agree. I think we're going to see for a long time. We've, we've touched on this next question a little bit, but I think right. maybe we'd have a little bit more to add. Mm -hmm. If you could snap your fingers and immediately alter one thing about the choral art slash profession slash system in California, what would you <laughs> alter? Okay, so we'll take off the table just snapping your finger and making the pandemic never happening, because <laughs> right? that's... Um, <clears throat> and you know what? Maybe I would... I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't do that, because maybe we maybe we peeled back a few layers of things that we act during that time. Maybe it was that we're... I'm, I'm I'm kind of a butterfly effect believer. Like I I almost believe that things things the universe has its way of. Anyways, that's another <laughs> that's a whole tangent I could go down. Um, <clears throat> so I won't I won't say that. But I think what I would say is, I would love to see much more attention and funding. And this is so cliche. You probably know what I'm going to say. Much more attention and funding to elementary and middle school oral programs. Um, I think we're, I think some districts are doing a very good job with this, but I, I just would like to see more of an initiative to, I don't know, like a have, have choral music be part of our society in the way that it is in some European countries, um, <clears throat> have students learning solfege from a very young age, even if they're ne never going to end up being professional musicians, they're never going to end up being singers. But I think, I think that's something I would like to see. I think it starts really, really early. Um, I think that's my number one, because I teaching in the community college system, <clears throat> we get a lot of students who have a lot of talent um, and they have not been given a lot of resources. And it's really amazing how I can predict who will come in ready and who will not based off of their zip code. And that's, hmm. that's not, a good thing. That's a, that's really shameful. So, um, I think, I think that it's very good that we have the community college system to help kind of correct that we have our applied. I'll talk a little bit later, um, about our applied voice program and how I really believe that that helps take down some of the gates that we put up, um, for, for, um, arts education, um, however, by the time they get to community college, it's too late. Um, you want to develop those critical skills early on in your brain development. And I think it's really sad that we associate excellent music making with wealthy districts and wealthy zip codes. And that's, I, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of money to teach a classroom of students solfege, right? It doesn't take a whole lot of resources other than in the hiring um, of, of the instructor. So maybe that's where the more resources need to be directed um, is into teacher salaries at, at the K through 12 level. Well, I, I will mm -hmm. echo what you said uh, in many ways. I will first sort of flippantly say that um, more bases would be nice. More um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know how things are up in Orange County, but I've wow. never had too many tenors, but like it almost feels that way sometimes. And, you mm. know, but bases, boy, yeah. yeah. I need more not, tenors and bases. <laughs> um, but really, if I could, if I could have one thing, it would be that every student 
age five to 18, has an opportunity to sing. Mm -hmm. Not every student will take it, but that they have a real and valid opportunity. And more students will take it if there is an opportunity that involves excellence because mm -hmm. people are naturally drawn to excellence. Exactly. <clears throat> and so if you have a choral program, if you have general music, if you have all of those things at their disposal, more and more students will choose it. Uh, so, you know, offering it in a real opportunity and not, you know, something that breezes through the district once every three years or something like that, uh, which is unfortunately, I think, what what a lot of students have. It's yeah. it's not much. And I I, I do want to kind of underline again, <clears throat> after a year of of being in administration, I I can really vouch for the fact that if you want something to be great, the first place to start is in the salary of the professional you hire. And I think a lot of times we see a lot of initiatives that bring money to the classroom. And I think that's great. And, you know, I appreciate the lottery monies that we get to buy our sheet music. We need that. I'm not saying we don't need that, but um, <clears throat> I think making people want to have the job and make, and then once they have the job, wanting to keep the job and seeing themselves working there permanently with a good quality of life that will create excellence. Like you will solve so many problems with that because um, the number one issue that you have, uh, the number one thing that will tank a program is a high level of turnover. And that's what we see in K through 12. And um, and I I never thought of, I mean, I, I've always said we should pay teachers more, but now that I have spent a year <clears throat> being a manager, getting resignation letters um, when deals were not good enough. And, and we, we have a good, we have a good situation here, in my opinion, um, in my district, I think I compared to the K through 12 system, at least. So um, I, I think that's really important. And I, I don't, I don't know, I don't necessarily hear enough people drawing that very direct line from the salary of the professional you're hiring to do the thing and the quality of the thing, right? I think that's yes. so important. How much have we heard about the teacher shortage? There's a way to fix it. <laughs> right. Yeah. They all talk, there's a teacher shortage. Well, and you know, if we're going to be passing these big multi-million dollar initiatives or multi-billion in some cases, in some areas, if we're, if, if we want to have these initiatives, I think if you poured it right into to salaries um, and recruitment and retention and making these professions, because, you know, make it competitive, make it a really competitive job. And you're going to get the best people to come out for that job. And then they're going to want to keep that job. Right. And so they're, they're going to want to, it, it just, it's such a direct, um, a direct connection in my mind. And so whoever's listening out there, pay teachers more. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Great. <clears throat> um, okay. So let's go to Q4. Um, what would you like to tell everyone listening today about the high school, community college, and CSU transfer process? And please talk about your experience with first generation students and their path to navigating this system. Very good question. Boy, I've been here six months. I feel like I shouldn't be the one answering this first. <laughs> um <clears throat> But I will talk a little bit about first generation students. Um, for all intents and purposes, I myself am a first generation college student. And uh, when I look back at my experience, you know, and my parents, who um, my dad had a good union job, and he was able to send his kids to college and I mean, really sort of live the American dream in many ways. And <clears throat> I look at that and I think, wow, you know, they they sent me to a private school to major in music. And I started as, as music ed. And I was sent out to do observations like, you know, week three. And I was like, mm, maybe K-12 isn't for me. So I switched to performance. Mm -hmm. And I had I had the talk with them, you know, to make sure it was okay. And there was a little trepidation from my dad. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. but not not really that much and i think now so much of our time we're talking like vocation language with our students and with their parents because their parents are really and truly and rightly so worried that mm -hmm. their kids aren't going to be able to make a living 
Yeah. And I think how much that's changed in 25 years because my parents, <clears throat> they weren't, that's, that's not what was top of mind. You know, they, they knew that I had ability and skill and talent that I would work hard and they supported me following my dreams. And so I think, especially for first generation students now, that's a, that, that's a tough nut to crack because so many of them, you know, they, they see this huge investment that they're going to make in the college experience. And they know that if they are an engineering major, they know what's at the end of that degree. If they're a nursing major. They know what's at the end of the degree, education, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Music is a little bit more of an esoteric cell, <laughs> but I mean, the thing I've been saying since I have arrived here is I can't think of a better place to work in the arts industry than Southern California, because there is so much of the economy mm -hmm. that is made up of arts and entertainment. And so I think that's a way to frame it, you know, with our first gen students. Um, the other thing, other than just, you know, getting them into the door of the program is making sure that they feel welcome. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned pretty quickly that a lot of my classmates had very different upbringings and I had a, had a great childhood and, mm -hmm. and I, I never felt like I was wanting for anything, you know, but when you meet people whose parents are surgeons or own surgery practices, or, you know, they like, they, they have means beyond what you could imagine in your middle-class upbringing. I think that, you know, that can be shocking. It can be alienating, you know, so just making sure that everybody is, is, has a place of welcome. And then another way that that can manifest itself, especially in ensembles is, I really am bothered when I see ensembles go on tour, but only the students that can pay for it go, mm, yeah, right? Yeah. <clears throat> like, oh, we're going to a choral festival in Hawaii or Puerto Rico or Madrid. And <clears throat> you're going to sing in a big mass choir, so you can bring four people or you can bring 30 or 70, um, but only the students that have means can do that, right? So immediately you're telling those students that don't have those means that here's an opportunity that you don't get to have. Uh, so that's at the same time, I think offering touring is incredible, Right. but I can't, I could never justify doing it if every student mm -hmm. isn't welcome. It's, so just yeah. finding ways to make sure that everybody is, mm -hmm. you know, able to, to fully participate, um, you know, that there aren't barriers in any way for those students. Um, I'm going to let you talk more about yeah. the transfer process sure, because sure, yeah. I am just learning and I should probably take notes yeah, while you do. Great. Well, it's funny you mentioned that about touring because um, I haven't toured yet with Fullerton College and, the, and you know, I we were supposed to um, in spring of 2020, no, 2021 spring, but... <laughs> We all know what happened there, right? Um, but you know, in addition to family planning, which is which is a personal thing because it's hard to <laughs> if you're in the midst of that, it's hard to plan a tour. But um, but one of the main reasons that I struggled with it is because I have undocumented students. So what am I going to do? Leave the country and and potentially put them in a bad? I mean, that's that's really hard. Okay, so you plan a domestic. All right. Well, we have this real ID thing coming through the pipe line are they going to be able to board a plane um what what's going to happen with that and that's all before you get to what you were talking about about students having the means to go or not to go and we have limited funding i mean it's hard and um i know that there are some people who have figured out how to do that um with with populations that are comparable to uh to those at fullerton college so i certainly look forward to offering a tour in the future but i agree with you i would i I don't think I would consider anything um, that didn't enable everybody to be a part of it because the whole point of tours in my mind is to bring together community, to strengthen your sense of community, not to uh, entrench uh, that sense of community or, um, you know, create trenches between groups of people. So uh, th thanks for mentioning that. I think that's a really important thing that not a lot of conductors um talk enough about it's all about oh flashy tour but let's talk about what goes into a tour they're very expensive um 
and that's, you know, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That's really important. Um, to respond to your comments about working with first generation students and like parental support and and framing a music education in the modern 2023 economy, right? Where, um, especially in Southern California, where rent and mortgages are high and the cost of living is very high. Um, it's not always easy for me to have these discussions with these students who come to me and tell me about these very, very, very challenging financial situations that they're in. A lot of times they're helping their parents pay the, the family mortgage. Um, they are working full time and just trying to finish school in the midst of that. And, you know, then I'm talking to them about a career that I entered and I, I'm very different from you. I am not a first generation college student. Um, my mother has her PhD from Stanford. Uh, my dad has a master of science degree. They, they met at Stanford. You know, they're, I grew up profoundly privileged and profoundly supported by them. I have wonderful, wonderful parents. And that's not to say, you, of course, you can have wonderful parents who aren't, you know, incredibly highly educated and all of that. But I not only had educated parents, but I had supportive parents. Um, I don't have any student loans. You know, I, I was able to, I got into Westminster and I said, I want to go. And it, I got some scholarships, of course, but like, I still paid, you know, and, and I, I didn't have to consider finances when making that decision. So a lot of times students will look at me and um, I'll share that I was 23 years old when I started at Fullerton College uh, in my first tenure track full-time professor position at age 23 with no work experience fresh out of grad school after going straight through from undergrad. That's insane. And um, yes, I worked hard to get there. Yes, um, I'm not trying to sell myself short, but um, a lot of students look at me and say, what's wrong with me? That, And now I'm a little older. That was a, almost a decade ago now. But at the time, they would say, what's wrong? wrong with me I'm older age or I'm older than you and you're teaching here and I'm here what's wrong with me and so I have to be really honest with them there's nothing wrong with you I, I am here again because of hard work and talent and all that but I'm here largely in part of the resources that I was given to enable me to be here at this age and you simply have not been given those resources, it's not your fault. You know, you're doing it, you're taking a different path and you can arrive at the same place, but it's not going to be the same path as someone with a very, very different situation. I mean, we're born into a certain situation with our family and you can't choose that. So what you do with it afterwards and how you can help um, help a student navigate that system based off of what, what resources they have access to, um, that has been my goal. Because I do feel guilty when they say, oh, well, I want to do exactly what you did and go straight through. And, and you know, I want to walk that line of encouraging them, but I also don't want to lie to them. You know, I don't want to tell them everything's going to be okay. Just go ahead and, and spend $200,000 on an undergraduate degree in vocal performance with no plan and you'll be okay. Because that's not always true. But I also want them to follow their passion because if they don't have something else that they are not equally or more passionate about, they're going to be lost. Um, so we have more conversations about um, being really realistic about the finances, right? So, okay, go to a Cal State, transfer in there. You've already made the right step by going to community college for your first, the first part of your education and, and going specifically Fullerton College because we have a very, very strong program. Um, send me an email if you're interested. <laughs> um, and uh, the first two years at Fullerton College are actually free. We have this awesome program that makes the first two years completely $0 for any California resident, um, which is amazing. So they've already made the right choice by getting that far. Um, so what do you do after that? Transfer to a Cal State or a UC somewhere in state where you can get that reduced tuition, um, get as many scholarships as you can, figure out how you're going to work through it because not working is not an option for my students. So many people, oh, well, you should you should prioritize school. That. That is a choice for some people. That is not a choice for my students, many of my students. It is not a matter of fun money. This is their survival money. So they have to work. So how can we find you the type of job that's going to be most conducive to you finishing schooling within that six-year period that, that you need to finish? Um, after that, what kind of job are you going to have? 
okay, you want to freelance perform. How are you going to make your money? Do you want to wait tables? Do you want to work in some other day job and do that in the evening? Do you want to have a teaching job? Do you want to open a studio? We have those conversations. So it's not, oh, you can't do music, but it's how are you going to make this all financially work when your student loan bills are due as soon as you graduate, right? And um, and actually that sounds like it's discouraging, but it's not. It makes it seem much more kind of achievable. You just have to plan and you help them in that planning process. Um, and that's a weird conversation to have with students when you're not their personal advisor, right? You're not their parent, but um, sometimes they need to have that conversation just to frame it and just to have them imagine their lives um, after school because it's terrifying, right? Um, and if they can't fall back on parental financial support, what are they going to do? Um, and I think we need to be honest with our students about that. We need to be really honest because otherwise they are just going to leave the, the profession altogether. Um, Sorry, that was a long rant, but let's talk about um, transferring. I love uh, I love our community college system here, and I grew up on the East Coast, so I we don't have anything that's even remotely close to what California offers. Nothing close. Um, so we are so fortunate to have community colleges that support the arts at at a true professional level. So um, I I think it's a wonderful thing, and also, I think students can get lost in the system. I have a lot of students who come to me who hang out for five, six years. Um, that's not what we want, <laughs> but it, you have to pass a certain amount of gen eds. You got to get your golden four before you move on to the CSU system. I think a lot of people think that they have to finish their AA degree before transferring. And I think... Um, I think that's not always the best course of action. Maybe if it's time for you to move forward and go to CSU, you don't need to finish your AA degree and it's better for you to just go ahead and transfer. Um, additionally, something that students face that's a challenge is getting into the gen eds that are required to transfer when, when um, not as much of a problem post COVID because enrollment is down. And so there are more seats available to students, but um, during times of high enrollment, it can be difficult to get into the section that will allow you to take all of your classes and graduate on time. But I would just encourage students to learn the skill and embrace the skill of asking for help because a lot of student services are available on most community college campuses. I mean, student service division work is a whole entire field of community college education that, that is like no other place than in California. And I think if students felt empowered to really seek out those services and, and those services are, are well communicated and readily accessible, um, they can have better counseling for the transfer process and all of that. So students need to seek that out um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Okay, that was a that was a lot of talking. I'm gonna let you talk. <laughs> well, I will say <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm still learning. I have mm -hmm. one semester under my belt. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still learning about uh, the California system, certainly. But one thing I did learn uh, in Minnesota, because the Minnesota state system where I was teaching was also the system that had all of our community colleges, was that, you know, when, when we're working on our curriculum, when we're revising things uh, at the at the university level, it's important that we keep in mind that what we do could have an impact on, on our colleagues mm -hmm. in the community college system, because, you know, we have expectations of what, what are lower division, what are upper division classes. Of course, yeah. And making sure that we keep that dialogue open about what students are bringing with them, what they can bring with them from the community college mm -hmm. system so that we're not, you know, basically just competing with each other constantly. And, you know, there will yeah. always be students who come straight to CSU. Of course, um, yeah. Uh, but the community college system is, you know, e even at the at the, the places where it's not free for two years, it right. it's so affordable. Um, and that's, it's incredible. Right. You know, and that, that's a way where I, you know, when I'm visiting high schools to recruit students, I want, I want to tell them to go sing in a choir when they're in college, no matter where they are. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's number one priority for me. Mm -hmm. um, no matter where they're going, sing in choir. 
Yeah. So, you know, that those opportunities exist for them, no matter what their major is um, and no matter where they're studying. Right. That is very important. I think a lot of students in high school think they have to be a music major to sing in the top choir at a university or a college. And that's just not true. I mean, we know it's not true, but a lot of these students, the number one question they ask is, can I be an engineering major and take choir still? And the answer is, of course, but I don't think enough students realize that. Yeah. Well, my marketing campaign at CSUSM, I hope, is is going to answer that question for them. <laughs> I am putting posters anywhere that I can put them and sandwich boards and just making sure that everybody knows that ensembles are open to all majors. All yeah, right, we have awesome. a we have a, a fun question. Ooh, I love fun questions. What is your secret non-musical passion? It won't be a secret anymore. <laughs> Okay, I have a really stupid answer and a really um, and a, and a much more less a much less embarrassing answer. Um, something I like to do to unwind at the end of a stressful day, particularly this past year when I was doing the when I was directing the choirs while also being the dean. That was insane and it was very stressful. And I would go home and nothing unwinds me more than watching a stupid, trashy reality television show. We're talking Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. You know all that all very, very dumb television because it's so, it just took me completely out of the world. It makes me laugh. It, I, I love the Bravo, you know, what else is there? E, MTV. I, I love stupid reality television because it's just so far from what we do every day. And it's so entertaining. Um, my, my less embarrassing passion. Um, my, my husband's a contractor. He builds um, professionally. He, owns a, a construction firm and something that we've started doing kind of on the side of that, that I'm really excited about is, um, is remodeling like smaller homes. And, um, and I, I really love the process of, and puzzle of taking a floor plan. I, I really like interior design and, and, um, and it's not just interior design, it's, it's space design. I, I really love that that I'm far from an architect. I'm not, you know, we're not, I'm not a professional, but I really enjoy, I, I really enjoy that, like things related to building houses and all of that. And actually, if I recall, if I can call him out, um, our host here, I, I went down and, and helped um, Arian with, with a little home project. Um, yes, our kitchen thanks you. Yeah, I helped him <laughs> space out his kitchen and you're given this tiny, you know, this like little chunk and how are you going to maximize the space? I love that stuff. I love pu puzzles like that. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of my answer too. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I've bought and sold and remodeled a lot of houses in my, oh, cool. in my day. And I, I love I love homes and I love projects and gardening. And oh, yeah. gardening. Um, one of the big appeals of San Diego is that you can grow things year round. Certainly not the case in Minnesota, um, except for inside. And then my cats would just eat them anyway. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we're we're renting this year as we learn mm -hmm. the lay of the land and figure out, you know, Sorry. where where in San Diego County we might want to land. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been a little bit of a frustration, you know. Mm. I have I have fixed a few things in the house we're renting, which I promised myself I wouldn't do. Right, but it's just a money it's hole. <laughs> just easier to do it um, yeah. than to, to call the landlord. But um, I think there really is something about you know because what we do is ephemeral, right? Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of recordings. I've listened to them. Most of them I've listened to once, like top to tail I listened to the whole album and when it was a physical CD then I'd be like okay that was nice you know yeah give that to somebody later right. um but nothing compares to live performance right you can you can watch the videos you can listen to the you know so it it is ephemeral mm -hmm. we can't you know right but if I tile my shower I get then to see it every it. morning yeah. right and it's another way to be artistic um, and I love, I love the puzzle of fixing things too. Yeah. You know, so that's, that must be a conductor. A that must be a conductor brain thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know? I maybe. think, I mean, yeah, it's funny. I always talk to my husband who, who is a, the general contractor. So he manages all of the subcontractors right. and, you know, he'll get a big job and they say, I want it to look like this. And he has to make it happen. And it is so comparable to what you and I do. 
in the classroom. It's fascinating how you can make such really direct comparisons between the two arts. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Welcome friend, back. <laughs> Good to see your face again. <laughs> it's been so wonderful to listen and just sit and hear you two speak uh, yeah. about the topics, about some really fascinating topics. Um, transfer to the CC system in California, transfer to the CSU system in California, first generation student experiences, uh, what different paths look like for different people. Um, mm -hmm. I get all of these questions too, and I've been taking notes uh, from you two day and great to learn that you um, that you also sh share this this secret hobby um, <laughs> what, I, what I particularly enjoyed is having someone from outside of the San Diego community and learning that we are essentially and effectively dealing with many of the same issues um across across this Pendleton boundary where mm -hmm. uh, Orange County is the next largest metropo uh, metropolitan or sort of populous, populous, not necessarily metropolitan, but populous area um, mm -hmm. outside of San Diego. And sometimes in San Diego, we feel a little isolated and a little unto kind of unto ourselves. Um, now, of course, we share uh, an incredible international international border, and so the, the the activities there are are rich, and there's incredible opportunities there. But also, kind of looking north uh, to the rest of California, uh, there's really not much difference between our what our colleagues are doing across the state and the issues that we're facing across right. the state, the solutions that we're coming up uh, across the state. And so this has been really uh, great and reaffirming uh, to hear to hear you two have this this conversation between. Uh, two collegiate educators. Um, thank you to uh, all of our constituents who will watch uh, this program. Uh, and I welcome you back to join us on March 23rd at 5 p.m. We'll be featuring uh, where the focus of our conversation will be uh, community, semi-professional and professional ensembles. Uh, we'll be featuring Dr. Charles Beal, who is the new artistic director of the San Diego Gamins Chorus, uh, and Benjamin T. Long, who is now here with us, who is the founder and director of San Diego-based amateur chamber choir, Stellarum. So we hope that you can join us for that conversation. And please join me in thanking Nicola and Aaron once again for sharing their insights with us today. Thank you two so much. Thank you thank for you. the opportunity to be here. Yeah, thank you. And Absolutely. really nice to meet you, Aaron. We should connect. Yes, we can send you some students. You. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I'll be at Casmic and ACDA, so I hope I'll Oh, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, great oh. to see you all.